time, please welcome Atlantic recording artist, Kix! Kix was formed in December 1977 in Hagerstown, Maryland by guitarists Ronnie Yonkins and Brian Forsyth and bassist Donnie Purnell. Singer Steve Whiteman and drummer Jimmy Chalfant would come on soon after. Signed to Atlantic Records, Kix would release their self-titled debut album, Kix, in 1981. Primarily written by Purnell, Kick's first album contains musical influences that range from 50s rock to some new wave elements, and of course blues. However, the Kick's attitude is already on full display with tracks like The Itch. The Itch was, uh, was the best song that helped us out on our first record. You know, it's like the one that everybody related to because people have dirty minds. And I realized that. <laughs> kicks are for kids also feels like a proper kicks track with the energy the band would become known for in later albums. The standout track, though, is clearly Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. A live staple for the band, this track has a spoken word bit in the middle where Steve could ad-lib a monologue. My main squeeze misses me, you know, and I kind of miss her too. And I'd just like to share with you, share with you if I may, what I want to do soon as I step in the door to see my baby sitting at home on the couch watching soap opera. Baby! While there are metal elements on this album, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a metal album, although it seemed to be categorized that way at the time. Originally, you established yourself as a heavy metal band. We did? Yeah, you did. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. That's what the press said. That's what all your fans say about you, okay. basically. That was the response to your band. But on the, the album that you just released that we were just talking about, Cool Kids, your sound is far more pop. <laughs> The sound on Cool Kids, released in 1983, definitely moves into a pop direction, with several cover songs and even more new wave bits. Guitarist Brad Divins would replace Ronnie Yonkins for this one album, and Cool Kids would get two music videos, which are pretty rough. They were god awful. <laughs> right. God. But that was more of a record company wanting you to do a commercial, like a new wave song on yeah, Body they Talk suck and too. stuff, right? <laughs> they suck too. <laughs> It's never expressly stated what it is they want the cool kids for. Unless it's just to wander aimlessly around the city and stop to rock out now and then. The second video from Cool Kids was Body Talk, a bizarre new wavy song that sounds better suited for a synthesizer than a rock band.
For some reason, the guys are watching a group of high school girls aerobicize while they play. Why did you make a change in your image? I think a lot of it had to do with the record company and our producer, Pete Solly. We knew we had to get music on the radio to get heard. And we put some outside music on the record and we, we listened to a lot of stuff and we, we heard Body Talk and Cool Kids and we liked them both. To be fair, I don't dislike this album. It just sounds like half of it was co-written by Haircut 100. On our second album, we had to make radio-oriented music, which we hated. So we got really pushed in a direction that we weren't real happy with. That whole Cool Catch record, we, we went out with a fake smile on our face and tried to present that record uh, to please the record label and the management. But we weren't real happy with that record. It wasn't the record we wanted to make. Kicks would bring back The Rock and Ronnie Yonkins for their third album, Midnight Dynamite. I am a huge fan of this album. It does mark another shift in tone, but this time it feels like Kicks have a clear glam metal direction in mind. The tracks are more guitar oriented and Steve gets just a little screamier. The album kicks off with the title track, which is a great mix of heavy riffs and a melodic chorus with energetic vocals. I love the song, but there's not much to the video. The most exciting part is Ronnie jumping into the crowd to do his solo. The track Cold Shower also got a music video. The video opens with some nerdy blonde guy laying on the couch reading a newspaper and listening to the radio. What a dork. It starts raining somehow and the band starts harmonizing as the guy lays on the couch getting drenched. Cold Shower is kind of interesting in that it's almost more of a rap than anything with a lot of percussive elements. Eventually, a woman in a green dress starts dancing in front of the nerdy couch guy, who's soaking wet now from the rain. Oh, cold shower. I get it. And of course, it turns out to be a dream anyway. Somehow, the excellent power ballad Walkin' Away did not get a video, which is a shame because it's one of the best songs on the album. Midnight Dynamite to me should have been a hit record, but once again, Atlantic Records dropped the ball, didn't do shit to push it, and didn't do anything. Kick's fourth album, Blow My Fuse, would make up for the lack of videos on the last album with four tracks getting videos, although that wasn't the initial plan. First up is Cold Blood, one of the band's biggest hits. The video is pretty much just a performance video with a few people in the audience, including a cute girl who they kind of focus on, but even she can't compete with Steve Whiteman's energy and red suspenders. The video for the title track is another concert performance video, but this time there's shots of the band around the city as well, chatting, getting in cabs, and just hanging out.
At first, Blow My Fuse did reasonably well, selling about the same as previous albums. Then Atlantic was convinced to release the power ballad Don't Close Your Eyes as a single. In this video, there's no audience at all, and we get cutaways of some girl who seems to be considering taking pills. She does not take the pills, and instead goes outside to stare at a plant. Don't Close Your Eyes would be Kick's biggest hit, giving the album a boost, and would lead to bigger touring opportunities. All right, here we are at the Headbangers Ball. I'm Stephen Piercy from Rat, and this is I'm Steve, Steve from Whiteman Kicks. from Kicks. Nice yes. to see y'all, Stephen. Good having to see you. Having a good you. time? Yes, definitely. We're having fun on the tour, We're huh? having a blast on the tour. Yeah, we want everybody to come out and see this show, Rat uh, Kicks. Let's play a video from you guys. Let's about, do that. About, it's the best uh, video you've never seen, right? It's the best right? video I've never seen. <laughs> Get it while it's hot. Get it while it's hot was the last video from Blow My Fuse. And for some reason, the guys are playing on the set of a cheap sci-fi movie. I guess if you have a cheap sci-fi set, you might as well use it. Overall, Blow My Fuse is a good album, but I still like Midnight Dynamite better. By 1991, Kicks had built up a debt with Atlantic Records that even the success of Blow My Fuse didn't cover. That, along with internal shifting within the label and the rising popularity of grunge, were all obstacles that Kicks wouldn't be able to overcome. Which is a shame, because their fifth album, Hotwire, is pretty good. The video is your typical high-energy kicks performance, but the track is a great kickoff to the album. This album feels just a little more relaxed to me than Blow My Fuse, with some excellent guitar solos. Well, most of our songs are guitar songs, guitar-oriented. Because these guys are good, so show them off. Sometimes we can't decide who's going to do the solo, so we just sw split them in half and switch off. And yeah. That way we both can, you know. Very easy. These guys work together great. Most bands go, that's my solo. You did the last one. These guys are like, you want to do it? I don't care. You do it. This was followed up with Girl Money, which has an early ACDC vibe. The video is a bit of a change this time with a black and white cabaret theme. It doesn't really go anywhere, but at least it's different. The power ballad for the album, Tear Down the Walls, also got a video. But unfortunately, this track isn't as good as the excellent previous ballads, Walking Away and Don't Close Your Eyes. But honestly, that's a small complaint. Some of Kick's best high-octane tracks are on Hotwire, like the excellent rock and roll overdose. Rock and roll overdose. Yeah. That's that's as you can tell it's a very up tempo hard rock and roll song. It's about it's just a it's like when you're a kid, you know, and, yeah. and, and you get your first couple records and you just play them and you play them and you play them and you gotta get more and you're addicted and you just gotta keep playing rock and roll because you're hooked on it. Rock and roll overdose. And it's harmless. You can't die. The final single from Hotwire was Same Jane. In the video, we see a fiery redhead, presumably named Jane, who was either dating or stalking some rich business guy. She can't seem to get his attention, so she starts dancing. Then later, she starts filming everyone at a fancy dinner. People aren't into it, and she eventually gets the camera taken away from her. She gets it back, apparently, because then she's recording the TV. But that gets boring, so she goes out for a night on the town. After changing outfits somewhere, maybe she's really insane, Jane. <laughs> K 
Kicks would get dropped by Atlantic Records after the release of Hot Wire and join up with indie label CMC Records for their sixth album, Show Business. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on with this creepy Barnum and Bailey nightmare cover. It's just weird, especially compared to previous album covers. Regardless, I have to hand it to Kicks. Despite the change in mainstream attention, they didn't really change their sound. They didn't really change ACDC's sound either. But the point is, show business is still pretty good, and even got a video for the track 911. It doesn't quite live up to some previous Kicks albums, but it's still worth checking out. After show business, Kicks would split up, with everyone going on to their own musical projects. Basically, there was a new party in town, and we weren't invited anymore. We went from playing arenas, down to playing clubs, down to playing, we called them french fry stands. I mean, it was so bad that we could hardly make a living at it anymore, so we knew it was time to call it a day. I still needed to rock, so I started Funny Money a year later. But in 2003, the band would be persuaded to get back together. My band, Funny Money, and Ronnie's band, Blues Vultures, played together, and then Brian flew in, and we all got together at the end of the night and did a little kick set. Everybody went crazy. Never thought it would ever bloom into anything more than that until I got a call from Sullivan Big, our agent from Big Time Entertainment, and said, Steve, give me a chance to book this band. I think I can get you guys back out there. And I said, no, no way in hell. It ain't going to happen. So two days later, after multiple phone calls, you know, this, he booked us into Rocklahoma. However, this would be without bassist and primary songwriter Donnie Purnell, who had had a falling out with the band. We had a conversation on the phone. I was going to uh, record a song with Funny Money that him and I had co-written. And I just called him up to say, hey, I'm going to record this song just to let you know. He tore me an ass. Oh, I mean, man. he jumped down my throat, and I just let him go. I held the phone out for about 20 minutes and let him rant and rave. And, and after he was done ranting, I said, I'm really sorry you feel like that. I used to have a lot of respect for you. We're done. That's the first time I ever spoke to him. Donnie would be replaced by Mark Shanker, bassist and vocalist for Funny Money. I became involved with Kicks. Uh, I played locally in the, in the Maryland area, and um, I was actually friends with... Uh, uh, Ronnie uh, when they were recording Midnight Dynamite and then Steve started a band called Funny Money. He was looking for a new bass player. I went up and talked to Steve one day and he said uh, he remembered me and uh, uh, said you know you can have the job if you want it. So, so I took the job and Steve and I started playing together and we started doing um, uh, talking about doing Kicks reunion shows and uh, you know I knew all the songs anyway so it was just kind of a natural thing for for me to just kind of step in and do that at first a new kicks album seemed unlikely it would be hard for us to put together a kicks album without the original member donnie purnell who did most of the songwriting however in 2014 they'd released their seventh album rock your face off and it's a good effort the energy is there and there are some great solos but it goes a little more in a late 70s direction than poppy 80s metal. But most importantly, it seems that making Rock Your Face Off was a much more satisfying creative experience for the band than it had been working with Donnie. It was a daring project because we were going into it without our main songwriter from the past and it was our first collaborative effort as a band. We all were in a room, we all had ideas, we were all able to speak our mind, change parts, make parts better. 
And it was the first time in our career as, as a band that we were able to do that. So we loved it. That's the way it should have been all along, and, and it's a shame that it wasn't. As opposed to do it like this, and, and don't don't waver from that. Listen to how I tell you to do it, and that's it. So we didn't have any of that. It was, it was you got an idea, let's hear it. And if it's good, let's use it. And that's Kicks, a super fun, high-energy band that deserves just a little more attention than they get. Your homework for this week is Midnight Dynamite, Blow My Fuse, and Hot Wire. For extra credit, show business is worth checking out too. Thanks for watching.